Thank you for joining us for another online program from the Adams County Historical Society. Tonight, we're continuing our series on the civilians of Gettysburg. We'll be looking at them before, during, and after the Battle of Gettysburg. Tonight's speaker is Linda Seaman, a licensed town guide here in Gettysburg, who regularly takes tourists around the town, points out the homes where the civilians lived, shows them the bullet holes, and tells the stories of what happened here before and during the battle. In our previous program, Ted Hurt, who is also a licensed town guide, spoke about Daniel Skelly and Albertus McCreary, two teenage boys who lived in Gettysburg and who were here during the battle. We are fortunate that both of them, as they became adults, decided to write their memoirs and share the stories of their Battle of Gettysburg experiences. Tonight, Linda Seaman is going to tell us about the civilians who had close calls during the battle, and there were many. She will give us a virtual walking tour pointing out the homes of the civilians who had chosen to stay throughout the battle, and many of them had close calls, and that's the theme of Linda's talk this evening. Linda is a native New Yorker from upstate New York, and she and her husband chose to move to Gettysburg for their retirement years, and Linda found the fun of guiding tourists throughout the town. I'm going to let her tell you her story of how she came here and how she was inspired to become a guide and take people through this very historic town. So Linda, I'm gonna turn the program over to you. Well, when we were thinking about retirement, I was trying to think of something, some hobby. Um, after eliminating a lot of things that I wasn't very good at, um, we happened to see Ken Burns's series on the Civil War. And I thought, gee, I'd like to visit Gettysburg. That just looked like fun. And when we drove into Gettysburg for the first time, I said to my husband, this is where we have to be. Wow. So um, when we retired, we moved down here. Um, our daughter lived in Northern Virginia, so this was good. And Gettysburg is, is really just a day's few hours drive from a lot of Civil War battlefields. So it was a great location. And um, we really love Gettysburg. So that's what brought us here. So how did you find out about the licensed town guides and become one yourself? Well, at first we considered, I considered the battlefield guide thing. Um, a lot of the battlefield guides though started when they were kids. I mean, uh, they spent years studying the battle. I was new to the game and found out I really didn't know a lot about the battle part of it and decided that, you know what, I found the civilian experience so much more interesting. So I decided to focus on the, on the civilians and I just find their stories are fascinating. So we settled on being a, a licensed town guide and I've loved it. Tell me about some of your favorite experiences. What do you like about it? I liked showing the kids, talking to the kids. We would do school groups and we would show them where a lot of the artillery shells were in the houses and um, they got a kick out of that. My one experience I remember very well is when I had a Boy Scout troop and I gave them each a name of one of the local kids in town. And then I gave the tour and told them what happened to each one of them on the tour. And it was really cute because they would, I heard two of them talking. He said, I lost an arm. The other kid said, I died. And I just got such a kick out of listening to them. And uh, that was fun. So I learned something every time I take a tour out. Um, people ask questions and you have to go back and study, and it's fun. It's just a fun thing to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Many Civil War historians feel that Gettysburg was the turning point of the Civil War. Some feel it was only one of the turning points in the Civil War. But either way, the 51,000 casualties attest to its importance in the Civil War. The famous three-day battle has been the subject of 30,000 books. Safe to say it is the most studied battle of the Civil War. The terms Fish Hook, Little Round Top, Seminary Ridge, Cemetery Ridge, Devil's Den, Culp's Hill, and Pickett's Charge are some of the landmarks that have become part of a universal lexicon. The streams that ran red with blood are clear now, and the fields that for years when plowed gave up remains of the dead once again give only crops. Gettysburg in 1863 was a town of 2,400, surrounded by beautiful orchards and farms. It had a college, seminary, doctors, taverns, hotels, stores, banks, newspapers, churches, and a railroad, and being the county seat, many lawyers. Gettysburg will forever be known as the place where on a cool, crisp November day, among the freshly turned graves of those who had given their last true measure of devotion, President Abraham Lincoln will deliver one of the most famous speeches in American history, the Gettysburg Address. What many visitors to our lovely town and military park are not aware of is the suffering and the challenges that the local population will experience, not just for three days or months, but years. Established in 1888, the Adams County Historical Society is the Adams County caretaker of millions of artifacts and records and will soon become a state-of-the-art museum and storage facility. It is among these wonderful treasures that we find accounts that give those civilians a voice to their experiences. These accounts tell us that the war was on most people's minds. The proximity of the Mason-Dixon line indicating the closeness to enemy lines, having lost two Union boys already, and reports that the rebels are coming, will have some more concern than others. Governor Curtin, seen here, will make it official when he sends a warning, the rebels are near. And General Darius Couch, who is in charge of the Department of the Susquehanna, urges the Pennsylvanians need to prepare to defend the Commonwealth. Winchester, Virginia will be hit that same day. An unknown at the time, another soldier citizen of Gettysburg, will be mortally wounded, Jack Skelly. The death of his friend and local girl, Mary Virginia Wade, will lead to the speculation as to the extent of their relationship, which still continues to this day. Acting on the governor's decree, local merchants will send away stock and valuables. Bank money will be sent away as well as valued horses and livestock. The frantic preparation will increase the anxiety. After a fire in Emmitsburg, not caused by the rebels, but not known for a time, will only add to the suspense. On June 17th, some 83 men from the town, college, and seminary will respond to the governor's call enlisting in front of Alexander Bueller's drugstore on Chambersburg Street. They will take a train to Harrisburg, and for just a week's training, they will become the 26th Pennsylvania Volunteers. Meanwhile, Robert Bell will form an independent cavalry troop, and when joined by 40 members of the Philadelphia City Troops, these and the untried 26 will comprise the defense of Gettysburg. Needless to say, when Early's troops enter on June 26, it was met without much opposition. Fear, panic, and flight probably best describes the result. The local telegraph operator, Hugh Scott, and Postmaster Bueller will escape. The shouts and gunfire created quite a scene and probably enjoyed only by the youngsters of the town. A local lad who fires a toy cannon was upbraided by a Southern general. I'm sure a memory that will stay with him forever. Southern General Early will issue his demands. 
His requisition will include 1,000 shoes, 500 hats, 60 barrels of flour, 7,000 pounds of bacon, 1,200 pounds of sugar, 600 pounds of coffee, 1,000 pounds of salt, and 40 bushels of onions. If fulfilled, the town would not be burned. Fortunately, David Kendallhart, seen here, borough president, not getting much input from anyone else, will on his own initiative explain that we did not have the goods to meet the demands, but the troops were welcome to shop for themselves. Paying in worthless Confederate money, it could not be said that anything was stolen. The scenes described by the civilians was one big comical free-for-all. Men wearing hats and petticoats and spurs on bootless feet. One young lad was happy recipient of a generous reb when he shared Petey Winter's candy with him. After the departure on the 27th, a quiet calm settled on the town. June 30th saw the arrival of General John Buford's Union Cavalry and renewed optimism, which was quickly dashed with the commencement of a three-day battle. Probably the best description of the civilian mindset was anxiety and fear. As we now know, eight citizens will be captured and sent south. Among them, George Kadui, who was 57. He will return in March of 65, but dies in April. Um, some other men with Crawford Ginn, Emmanuel Trussell, who using a cane and crutch will walk over 150 miles to a southern prison, William and Alexander Harper, nephew and uncle Samuel Pitzer and George Arndt. Three days of cannon and small fires arm and roving southern troops, however, will lead to many brushes with death and some civilians being fortunately only temporarily detained or sent to a southern prison for a short stay. One of those temporarily detained was Dr. John O'Neill, a Maryland physician who came to Gettysburg with a promise he would tend to the almshouse residents. His sentiments lay with the South in that he defended slavery. He was not alone in this sentiment, and the term Copperhead would probably define more than a few in Gettysburg. His house calls will take him out Mummersburg Road and include a wounded rebel soldier and Mr. Myers. On Chambersburg Pike, near Harris Tavern, he was detained in question by General Pettigrew with this Confederate Army. At first, the general seemed satisfied with the doctor's explanation, but shortly after allowing him to proceed, the general request his company. Dr. O'Neill felt it better if he stayed with the general and ended up meeting a doctor friend from Baltimore. Later, when he felt it safe to attempt his escape, he decided to try to reach his home on Baltimore Street, where the present day library is. After wending his way close to home, he was stopped by some of Ewell's men. Upon promising a bottle of whiskey, if given an escort, he will make it home safely. Dr. O'Neill will keep a day book of his visits, and it will be invaluable pinpointing Confederate burial sites. Another local man faced possible capture. Dr. Luther Stover and his wife, Elizabeth McConaughey Stover, lived on the southwest corner of the square, which for many years was the house of Bender. Elizabeth's father built his home in the early 18 teens. They rented out the bottom floor to John Schick as a dry goods store, and they lived on the upper floors. Professor Stover was accosted on the street by General Early, who wanted to take him along to question him. He said he was concerned for his family's safety that night, but promised to turn himself in the next day. Fortunately, the withdrawal of the Confederates saved him from further issue. The building will be used temporarily by the Christian Commission after the battle. Another member of the McConaughey family, Hannah McConaughey McLean, and her lawyer husband Moses lived only a couple of doors south of the Stover's present day Christmas house. She busied herself performing household tasks, having decided the heavy feather mattress they had brought down for their daughters to sleep on was too hot, they decided to put it in the garret until fall. While waiting for assistance, an artillery shell, probably from Cemetery Hill, pierced the wall next to Hannah, rolled down the stairs. 
She's covered in dust and feathers, and I'm sure it took her a few minutes to realize that she had avoided death as the ball had not exploded. This is a picture of the McLean house, and there is a shell visible on the side of the building. Hannah will die in 1873. Around the corner on 22 East Middle Street, her son William and his ill wife also had a neural escape with death when after shortly leaving her sickbed and he trying to satisfy his curiosity, will barely avoid a bullet entering the house and striking the footboard. A few days earlier, William's daughter Mary serenaded some Southern soldiers with the song, Hang Jeff Davis from a Sour Apple Tree. Fortunately, these soldiers took it with a sense of humor and no one was arrested. Henry Staley, editor of the Democrat compiler newspaper, had the misfortune of having made a political enemy of David McConaughey, a Republican. A Colonel Dudley of the 19th Indiana had sought help, and after taking him in, Staley will enlist the aid of the Southern surgeon from the courthouse. After the battle, he was arrested for revealing Colonel Dudley to the enemy. According to him, charges were made by Mr. McConaughey. Sent to Fort McHenry, Mr. Staley will eventually be released, but will be rearrested several more times. The compiler, located on Baltimore Street, is marked by Penelope, a cannon that was shot off to celebrate a Democratic election win. Having been overloaded, it will explode in 1855. The breach buried in the sidewalk has been there since. Mr. Staley will die at the age of 69. He will be buried in Evergreen Cemetery, on whose board he served for several years. Ironically, he is buried within 35 feet of his nemesis, McConaughey. A number of local men and boys anxious to get on the excitement, will venture up to their roofs to observe the fighting. One of the best observation spots was the Fonestock Dry Goods Store, owned by three brothers. Once the bullets started whistling past their heads, self-preservation kicked in, and the decision to keep their heads down was made. Daniel Skelly, the young employee, will also invite the 11th Corps General O.O. O. Howard temporary battlefield commander up to observe the fighting. Skelly will one day own the store. The store will also house the sanitary commission after the battle. The George Little family on West Middle Street and eight neighbors will gather in the small rear room. Shells began falling all around. Two will hit the yard. Asked what to do, George replied, pray. The present day house incorporates the historical and a newer addition. The outside cellar entrance probably discouraged them from going down sooner, but when a shell hit close to the door, they rapidly left for the underground sanctuary. Praying must have worked, for as soon as they were gone, a shell will explode and destroy the room they had just left. George died in 1878 at the age of 71 and is buried next to his wife, Christina, in the Evergreen Cemetery. Salome Elizabeth Myers, Sally, she known to her friends and her family, lived on High Street, a few doors west of the St. Francis Xavier Catholic Church. The home rented by her father, Peter, and mother, Hannah Sheeds, looks much like it did in 1863. Sally was a young school teacher and admitted to being sickened by the sight of blood but will attempt to help out when the church becomes a hospital. Upon entering the church, she will see a severely wounded soldier. Asking if there's anything she can do for him, he replied, no, I'm going to die. Upon hearing this, she will leave the church, sit on the steps and cry, saying she couldn't do this anymore. The doctor will come out and beg her to come back because they desperately need it. She will resume helping to take care of the wounded. She will have the young man that she first met move down to her home, where she will take care of him personally. She will lay on the floor next to the couch where he was and fan him because of the heat and humidity to try to make him more comfortable. 
After doing this for just so long, she was beginning to get cramped. And immediately after standing, a bullet went to the floor where she had been laying. Unfortunately, Sergeant Alexander Stewart of the 149th PA will succumb to his wounds. The next summer, his widow and brother will visit her and thank her for taking care of their husband and brother. Sally will ultimately fall in love with his younger brother, Henry. They will eventually marry and move to Western Pennsylvania, where he will be a minister. Unfortunately, Henry had been wounded in the war and will die from his wounds before Sally gives birth to a son. Sally will return to Gettysburg and resume teaching. Her son, Henry, will become a doctor. Sally will be very active in and elected treasurer of the National Association of Army Nurses. Not being an enlisted nurse, this would be quite an honor. She dies at 79, a little over 100 years ago, in January 1922. On her tombstone are the dates of her birth, marriage, parted by her husband's death, and reunited when she dies. She is buried in Gettysburg Evergreen Cemetery with her son at her side. Descendants still live in Gettysburg today. Her diary will be published entitled The Ties of the Past, The Gettysburg Diaries, 1854 to 1922. The house on the northwest corner of High and South Washington Streets has the distinction of being hit three times by artillery shells. The Foster family had several close encounters. Catherine Foster's father had been assaulted by a Confederate soldier who demanded money. They didn't get much and fortunately left without harming them further. Catherine and her cousin Belle, who attended Rebecca Eister's Young Lady Seminary, were stationed on the back porch handing out water to the soldiers as they came through town. Fortunately, they abandoned their post before narrowly avoiding a shell that demolished it. Two more shells will hit the home, and again she will escape harm, as will the doctors who were boarding there. Catherine, known for her caring and charitable nature, must have been a very blessed girl. After her parents' death, she will move to Johnstown to be with Belle. In 1889, she will be in the middle of the biggest civilian flood in American history, the Johnstown flood. Over 2,100 people will die in that flood. Catherine will escape death, jumping from her home's roof safely to another. I have often said if we had a lottery back in those days, she would be the one you'd want to buy the tickets. Catherine will die at the age of 91 in 1919 and is buried in the Evergreen Cemetery alongside her parents. The abandoned Shriver house will be taken over by snipers who use the attic. It is believed the bullet from here was the one that killed Jenny Wade, but being only one of several nests that is open to debate. The close by Harvey Sweeney house, present day Farnsworth house, will sustain over 100 bullet holes on the south wall. Lincoln's visit will elicit a long descriptive letter from Harvey to his brother and preserve a vivid memory of that historic day. This is an image of the side of the building with the bullet holes showing. Local folklore says anyone who puts his finger in the bullet hole will be getting married soon. General Schimmel Fignig of the 11th Corps will find an escape place between the woodshed and the pig pen. Catherine Garlock will be approached by a southern sniper demanding access to her garret and aware of the general's precarious position will be firmly refuse. Citing danger of drawing enemy fire to her children and thwarting his efforts to gain entry, her biggest challenge will be keeping her family dry in the flooded basement. Her husband's wood will supply a coffin for General John Reynolds, a first day fatality, who had been taken to the George Doris house on Stanmore. The unfortunate tannery owner, John Rupp, will be caught between the lines with the Rebs occupying the north and the Union will occupy the south side of the house, while he is literally trapped in his basement. The 1863 house was one of five identical homes all in the same area. John dies in 1871 and is buried in Evergreen Cemetery next to his wife, Caroline.
A little further north on Baltimore Street is the Methodist Parsonage. Ten-year-old Laura Burkestresser will experience an unforgettable brush with death. While watching the excitement from an open window, an artillery shell will pierce the wall, careen around her room before exiting the window. A shell can be seen today, one of nine visible shells, either original or representative from 1863. A local pastor must have really put some faith in the Lord's protection. The Reverend Andrew Essek will station himself in the St. James Cupola on the corner of York and Stratton Street and watch the action. When the church is torn down, dozens of bullets embedded in the wood were found. Mary Thompson lived on Chambersburg Pike and will be surrounded by fighting men. Born in Littlestown in, in 1794, she married Daniel Sell and had three children. Her daughter Hannah will live down the road. Mary will wed Joshua Thompson and bear five more children. Her husband will eventually abandon her. Her small stone house will become known as Lee's headquarters. Thaddeus Stevens, a local lawyer, will purchase a house in trust for her, where she will live until her death in 1919 at the age of 91. She cooked and cleaned at the seminary for many years. She is buried at the Evergreen Cemetery as well. On Chambersburg Pike sits a wonderful example of Victorian Gothic revival known as Carpenter's Cottage. The architecture, the building, is the scene of a dramatic confrontation on July 1st, 1863. At the time, this building was Miss Carrie Sheed's Oak Hill Seminary School for Young Ladies. Colonel Charles Wheelock, 51, was commander of the 97th New York. He was tall and strong with a heavy frame, a generous and influential man, but not blessed with great health. The Oneida County 97 New York boys fought with Baxter's brigade, and Wilcock will find himself captured and under arrest at the Sheed School. When demanded that he surrender his sword, Colonel Wheelock, being a very determined man, threatened to break it infuriating the rebel and the thought of being shot. Miss Carey, at her own risk, will intervene and calm the heightened temper. While the officer was distracted, Carey will hide Wheelock's sword in the folds of her skirt. When the officer returns and again makes his demands, Colonel Wheelock says he surrendered it to another Confederate. Colonel Wheelock will escape with the aid of a local family and will return for his valued possession, a gift to him by his men. In the foothills of the Adirondacks, in a small town cemetery of Boonville, my husband's hometown, and where I worked for five years, there is a beautiful monument to that same Colonel Charles Wheelock, he, where he was considered a Civil War hero and local celebrity. It is ironic that on our first visit to Gettysburg in 1991, one of the first stories we heard was of our local hero in a town over 355 miles away from home. Our battlefield tour guide was local history professor Colonel Jacob Sheeds, an ancestor to Miss Carey. We were unaware at the time that our guide was considered among the most preeminent citizens of Gettysburg. Colonel Sheeds was extremely proud of his local and Civil War connections. He passed away in 2002 and rests among some 75 Sheeds members in Evergreen Cemetery. In Colonel Sheeds' words, the nation was born in Philadelphia, but was preserved in Gettysburg. I would add, thanks to the Adams County Historical Society, the experience of the civilians who came before us will be forever preserved as well. Thank you. Linda, thank you for giving us your tour of the town. What a fun way to do it by looking at the homes where these people lived and hearing the stories of the individuals. Now, I understand you had a second career here in Gettysburg as a volunteer at the Adams County Historical Society, and you were lucky enough to be there when Dr. Gladfelter was the head of the society. You spoke so warmly about him this morning. I wish you would share some of your stories with our viewers. 
Dr. Charles Gladfelter was a very special, very special man. Um, he used to tell us that we could call him Charlie, but I didn't feel comfortable calling Dr. Gladfelter Charlie, so we called him Dr. G. And the thing that was nice about having Dr. G when I volunteered on Fridays, um, along with the, we used to call ourselves the Fabulous Four, um, is if we had a question, all I had to do was ask him if we had this or not. And if he said we had it, then you'd go look. If he said no, we don't, then I knew I didn't have to worry about it because Dr. G knew what was there and what wasn't there. Um, the man had a range of knowledge that was unmatched. Um, he did uh, books on the churches, um, the manner of mask. Um, he was just such a knowledgeable man. And you could ask him pretty much any question. And he was not at all uh, hesitant to answer and not make you feel small about it. The only time he was angry was when somebody got something wrong and it was in a book. <laughs> then you would hear about it. <laughs> but otherwise he was just a he was just a very warm, lovely man. Thank you. Miss so him a lot. <laughs> Thank you.